Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Development Bank's Asian Impact Webinar. My name is Lisette Cipriano. I am a Principal Digital Finance Specialist here at the ADB. Uh, this 10 a.m. session is titled Promoting Small Firms for Resilient, Gender Balance Growth in the Pacific. As many of you know, uh, low business diversity can limit Pacific countries' growth potential. Asia Small and Medium Sized Enterprise Monitor 2023 shows how promoting women's entrepreneurs can be part of the solution. This webinar will discuss key findings from the business survey conducted in Fiji and explore needed policy actions for gender mainstreaming in the Pacific. This morning, we hope that you will walk away first gaining a deeper understanding of the challenges in women-led small firms through the survey findings in Fiji, and second, that you will walk away understanding the policy actions needed to support women-led small firms and entrepreneurs in the Pacific. We look forward to hearing from you, the audience. Please do ask us um, your questions. Ask our panel experts uh, that are here today with us via the chat box, and we will do our best to answer all of your questions that we receive. Before we proceed with the program, Ms. Sarah Dugu Kanavanua, Halofaki from the Ministry of Women, Children and Social Protection, sends her regrets as she will not be able to join us today due to the recent typhoon that hit Fiji last week. However, we still have the rest of our panels, uh, our guests here today, who will share um, deep insights on, on some of the issues in, in Fiji. Without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Shigehiro Shinozaki, who will present the study on promoting small firms for resilient gender balance growth in the Pacific, providing a gender perspective in Fiji. Shinozaki-san is a senior economist at the Economic Research and Development Impact Department of the ADB. He supports ADB's developing member countries in improving small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, um, access to finance through various uh, technical assistance projects. His advisory and research expertise includes policy issues in SME development, inclusive finance, and financial sector development, especially in developing Asia. With that, I hand the floor over to Shinazaki san Thank you, Lizette. And um, so good morning, and thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. Uh, today, so I'd like to discuss how promoting women entrepreneurs uh, can contribute to business diversification and also expand the growth potential of Pacific economies uh, based on the findings from this Asia SME Monitor 2023 uh, and the business survey uh, conducted in Fiji. So this year's Asia SME Monitor uh, focuses on the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific economies uh, continue uh, recovering so from the so COVID-19 pandemic, uh, backed by a strong tourism rebound. However, uh, growth is expected to slow so this year uh, due mainly to labor shortages exacerbated by immigration and also continued inflation. So strengthening the women's empowerment so is key for resilient, inclusive growth in the Pacific. So given that women's owned businesses are mostly small businesses, so encouraging so women entrepreneurship is a, a critical component so of the national MSME development policies. So my presentation today so will address the gender perspective in Fiji. Okay. So this is the so overview of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, or MSMEs, in Asia and the Pacific, uh, based on available data from 24 countries. MSMEs in the region accounted for an average 96.6% of all enterprises, 55.8% of the total workforce, and 28% of a country's economic output. In the Pacific, MSME data remain limited or non-existent in many countries. For Fiji, uh, the employed by MSMEs and their output were lower than so those in other Asian countries. So for uh, access to finance, uh, bank loans to MSMEs 
averaged 10.6% uh, of a country's GDP and 22% of total bank lending uh, based on the latest available data through 2022. For Fiji, uh, these indicators were also lower than other regions' averages. Okay, uh, this slide shows the condition of women's business participation in the Pacific. A left-hand side figure indicated that the share of firms with female ownership is relatively higher in small and medium-sized enterprises. The middle figure shows that over 80% of women-owned MSMEs are operating in the informal sector. And the right-hand side, for Fiji, female labor force participation rates are having unchanged or around 38% over two decades. Uh, and so over 40% of female employees work at informal businesses in Fiji. So these facts suggest that the resource of women has yet to be so well utilized in the, in, uh, utilized in the formal economy. Okay. So this is this conceptual flow chart to accelerate MSME dynamism toward resilient, inclusive growth in the Pacific. So according to our Asia SME monitor, uh, there are several uh, persistent challenges on MSME development. Uh, that is uh, brain drains, high business costs uh, brought by ongoing inflation and global supply chain disruptions, low business diversifications with limited uh, product uh, development and also little branding strategies, untapped resources in business uh, uh, like uh, women and youth, and also underdeveloped infrastructure uh, such as storage, transport, and ICT, and uh, some regulatory burdens, uh, barriers uh, for investing in MSMEs. Uh, there are six key areas uh, that can help MSMEs uh, contribute to stronger growth and better livelihood across the Pacific region. So namely, uh, sustainable tourism, international trade, agribusiness development, skilled labor mobility, digitalization, and finance. Also, women empowerment, so is a uh, uh, cross-cutting agendas across these areas. So if the government so take a good step to promote these areas, so we can expect a strong MSME dynamism, so nationally and uh, also contribute to uh, resident inclusive growth in the Pacific. So now I'd like to share with you key findings from the MSME survey in Fiji uh, that we conducted in August this year in cooperation with the Ministry of Trade, Cooperatives, and SMEs in Fiji. Uh, please note that so this case study uh, was not included in the Asia SME Monitor 2023 uh, because uh, the survey was just completed in end, end of August this year. So this case study may be published separately. So in this survey, uh, we received a total 321 complete responses from MS MSMEs in Fiji. Uh, more precisely, uh, their micro and small enterprises uh, based on the national MSME classification. The survey respondents included both formal and informal businesses. 71.7% came from services, 21.8% uh, so from agriculture, and 6.5% from manufacturing. Uh, more than half of the respondents were young startups uh, operating for up to five years. For women-led MSMEs, it accounted for 53% of total respondents. Women-led MSMEs are likely to have the larger number of female employees than men-led MSMEs. 
So also the share of firms operating e-commerce was larger in women-led MSMEs than those led by men. Uh, uh, just uh, as a so technical note, uh, it should be noted that so samples were uh, not selected randomly so because of the so nature of this online survey, uh, and the national statistics framework not yet to be established in Fiji. Uh, thus, the survey result uh, may have uh, um, some sort of this so self-selection problem or uh, non-response biases. So uh, this should be taken out so for the interpretations of this art. Okay, so the survey questionnaire so asked enterprises the extent to which uh, their uh, business environment was changed as compared to end 2022. In the left-hand side figure, red bar is about women-led MSMEs, while a blue bar is for men-led MSMEs. Overall, uh, there was no big difference on the perception of business environment between them, but a relatively larger share of women-led MSMEs felt worse business environment than those led by men. Around a quarter of the women-led MSMEs felt better business environments post-pandemic. Meanwhile, around one third are reported a bad business environment than before. Uh, high production and administrative costs brought by ongoing inflation still negatively affected small farms operations, uh, which was more pronounced in small agribusinesses. Okay, so firms' revenue condition was mixed uh, post-pandemic. As you see the figures in this slide, around 22% of respondents reported no change of monthly revenue conditions. Uh, but uh, two groups, uh, those profitable and unprofitable, appeared uh, tangibly, uh, more pronounced in agribusinesses and services, and women-led MSMEs. They faced relatively larger revenue losses uh, while the increased revenue uh, losses uh, so than men led uh, uh, firms. Okay, so as for this employment size post COVID 19, uh, more than half of firms are reported unchanged, uh, regardless of business ownership and sectors. However, uh, we could see uh, some movement uh, on increasing employees post-pandemic, so for firms that gain. On the other hand, uh, we could also see uh, those suspending employment or decreasing employees uh, for firms unprofitable. So employees' working environments are also largely unchanged, uh, regardless of ownership. Some firms tried controlling their internal costs, so by reducing working hours and also cutting staff. For the total wage payments, around 60% of women-led MSMEs reported unchanged post-pandemic, uh, whose ratio was larger than the men-led MSMEs. But we could see uh, those profitable increased wage payments, uh, while those unprofitable suspended or decreased the wage payments to employees. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, uh, high business costs, so brought by ongoing inflation and global supply chain disruptions, is one of these persistent challenges on MSME developments in the region. A total 60% of uh, women-led MSMEs reported the cost increase. So many small firms tax the high cost of supplies and also raw materials. So regarding a firm's financial conditions, the certain number of MSMEs were able to hold enough funds to operate post-COVID-19 pandemic. 
Meanwhile, uh, those that reported already no funds or running out funds in six months uh, remained larger share, especially for women-led MSMEs, indicating the total 65% of women respondents. Uh, securing the working capital so remained a critical issue for many MSMEs, even post-pandemic. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, MSME access to bank credit somewhat improved, uh, supported by the government financial assistance during the pandemic. A relatively larger share of women-led MSMEs applied for bank credit, but a smaller share received loans uh, than men-led MSMEs during the pandemic. Overall, their reliance on informal finance remained very much high. So being back to the normal life post-pandemic, the financial conditions of survey MSMEs now either returned to the pre-pandemic level or worsened. So due to the government, emergency financial assistance measures were partly terminated. So this slide shows uh, policy measures that women-led MSMEs desired. As you see, a cash subsidy was the top policy measure desired by them. It was followed by business development services, support for workers' scale upgrades, and more comprehensive information platforms on government assistance programs. This slide is about financial assistance measures that women-led MSM is desired. Interestingly, support for access to trade finance and supply chain finance was highly desired by them. It was followed by the development of market-based financing or capital markets and also concessional loans. Capital markets are underdeveloped in the Pacific, actually. Nevertheless, uh, women MSME owners and managers surveyed uh, showed their interest in tapping alternative financing options like uh, equity or bond markets. So given that uh, special equity markets for small firms have emerged in developing Asia, so it is worth consideration to create the market-based financing options for viable MSMEs in the Pacific countries, if it's feasible. Okay, so this is the summary of key findings from this MSME survey in Fiji, uh, addressing the gender perspective that I discussed today. Uh, uh, but this, because of the time constraint, so I skip this. Please check this later. Okay, now so I'd like to review the Awareness of issues extracted from this Asia SME Monitor 2023. So skill labor shortages or brain drain, low business diversification, a large base of informal businesses, less business digitalization, and a lack of alternative financing options are all critical barriers on accelerating this MSME dynamism in the Pacific. So given the findings from this Asia SME Monitor 2023 and the MSME survey in Fiji, I'd like to raise eight points for policymakers to address uh, towards the uh, MSME development and gender mainstreaming in the Pacific. Number one, uh, domestic labor markets uh, should be strengthened by using untapped resources like uh, women, youth, and MSMEs. And number two, Domestic businesses uh, should be diversified uh, through promoting the internationalization of MSMEs. So especially innovative women-led businesses that seek to participate in global marketplaces. And number three, a national entrepreneurial base uh, should be created uh, through promoting women and young entrepreneurs. And number four, Digitalization uh, should be 
encourage nationally uh, through improving competitive ICT infrastructure and promoting e-commerce, e-payments, and digital finance solutions. And number five, encouraging uh, registering informal businesses or formalization is also very much so critical to this end. And number six, uh, priority sector support like agribusiness development and sustainable tourism is key to boost uh, business productivity. And seven, alternative financing options for viable MSMEs, especially women entrepreneurs, uh, should be developed. Addressing so trade finance, value chain finance, digital finance, and market-based financing. And lastly, regularly updated MSME landscape data uh, should be established nationally. So including sex disaggregated data uh, to promote gender balance growth, so in the Pacific. Okay, uh, for more information, uh, please visit our ADB website on Asia SME Monitor. The 2023 edition is available so at the website, so with downloadable data. Okay, so I will stop here. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Shige. Um, just to remind everyone uh, that the link is also available in the chat box. So if you'd like to um, get access to that, then please do so via the chat box. So now we'd like to turn to our guest panelists um, who will share with us their insights and learnings from the region. First, we have Ms. Sarah Boxall. Um, Sarah currently works full time uh, as the economic empower um, uh, the economic empowerment of women specialist for the Asian Development Bank Pacific Private Sector Development Initiative um, to create opportunities for women to participate in the economy as consumers, business owners, and leaders. She is a passionate advocate for gender equality. And she has over 20 years experience in international cultural exchange, education and development in a range of organizations, including government, multilaterals, universities and not-for-profits in Australia and overseas. In her previous role, Sarah has led the development, implementation and review of national, regional and multi-country programs focused on women's economic empowerment, women's political participation and leadership, ending violence against women and girls, and humanitarian response. She knows the Pacific very well, and we look forward to hearing some of her insights on women SMEs. We also have, as our guest panelist, uh, Mr. Faisal Khan. He is the Director and Registrar of Cooperatives at the Ministry of Trade Cooperatives, Small and Medium Enterprises, and the Program Director of MSME Fiji. He has been in this role since 2019, and prior to that, he also worked for the Ministry of Public Enterprises for eight years. Sarah and Faisal, welcome, uh, and thank you so much for um, sharing uh, your time with us today. Uh, so before we, um, uh, we go to... Um, some of the key points. Um, we'd like to uh, remind everyone that, you know, again, that the study is available at the chat. Uh, please do so and access that. Uh, please go through that to the chat box. Um, so without further ado, I know we are conscious of, of time. Uh, I'd like to turn to Faisal now, um, who is doing great work uh, with women SMEs in Fiji. Um, Faisal, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the MSME policy, policy framework and action plans that your ministry has uh, developed um, addressing women-led MSMEs and entrepreneurships? Um, I understand that there is some work on establishing definition for women um, uh, SMEs in Fiji. Um, what are some of the best practices uh, you've seen uh, across the region as well, if you can provide us some insight around that? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, good uh, afternoon from Fiji um, to the colleagues uh, joining virtually. 
Um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this forum, and uh, thank you to CJ for his uh, elaborate and uh, insightful presentation regarding the uh, landscape of MSMEs in Fiji. Um, uh, to answer your question, I believe that right now we have got a, in terms of policy, that's the MSME framework right now, MSME policy framework. Um, and obviously in that itself, we try to sort of promote uh, gender empowerment or women empowerment through our gender lens. Uh, we have in, in all our policies right now, we have tried to adopt, um, try to ensure that there's inclusion of uh, women empowerment or look at things from a gender lens. Uh, so for the past say, two to three years, even when we make budget submissions to the um, to our um, budget central agency, which is the Ministry of Finance, we ensure that our economic empowerment programs does have a gender lens. Um, so just uh, very briefly, like for example, the ministry has given out grants of close to 102 million worth, uh, Fiji and 102 million dollars uh, over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And in that itself, close to 40, 45, close to 45% have been female recipients. So although it's not 50 50, but at least the balance is it's a much more balanced compared to other places. And in terms of uh, definition right now, Yes, our definition is gender neutral. Uh, however, there has been some recommendations made by some working groups that includes the Reserve Bank to include a woman-led and uh, woman-owned definition within our MCM framework. So we are just waiting for the uh, submissions from them that we're happy to consider that. And I suppose whilst we are working on our MSME Act, this is an area that we can further explore as well. That is wonderful work. And and when do you foresee this um, coming into fruition? Sometime around 2024? Yes, definitely. We are looking at uh, 2024. Um, so we sort of, fingers crossed, we'll be able to get that across the line in 2024. Great. Wonderful. Um, Shiga earlier mentioned that um, many of the women entrepreneurs actually fall under the category of um, informal businesses. What are some of the key challenges for creating a base uh, of women entrepreneurs in, in Fiji? Um, being that there are many of them are quite informal. Uh, from your point of view, um, what are some of the access issues, access to finance barriers that many of uh, these women entrepreneurs are, are facing? And what do you think is the role of digitalization um, or innovation um, for supporting these women SMEs? I think uh, the barriers for, so the, I understand your question is in two parts. One is uh, in terms of the barriers for women in access in finance or in Fiji, and also the role that digitization plays in for to help women access those financial opportunities. <clears throat> so to begin with, I think right now for a woman to sort of, or female business entrepreneur, to access finance, the biggest challenge is her security. Um, because traditionally in Fiji, the assets, which is the land, is mostly written to the uh, under the man's name or under the husband's name. So in terms of security, uh, that is sort of one of the uh, challenges that they have in terms of doing the business in order to access the loan. So right now we currently have got a program uh, that is run by the Fiji Development Bank, which is one of our development funding partners. So they have got a special product just for women-led entrepreneurs, whereby the security of 10% is paid by the government. Uh, so they've got a product up to $5,000 for the startup, and 10% of that is paid by the government as the security interest. So we've got one product that sort of, sort of addresses that, but uh, we only see that that came to fruition in last year. So it's a fairly new product. Um, and uh, all these years, yeah, the women were sort of struggling to find um, uh, access to finance was still an obstacle, uh, mainly because whenever they went to banks, they were told that they don't have securities under their name. 
in terms of grants where you don't need a security, some of the barriers that they had was that if they were just um, either unaware of the grant programs or they uh, they were just burdened by, um, say, domestic chores uh, to sort of really take time out to fill in a business plan to apply for the application or apply for the grant application. And, and so the unpaid work that they did sort of took a toll on on their work in terms of really developing the businesses. Right. And so collateral, presentation of collateral is still uh, an, an issue. And do you think that digitization has a role to play in that? Um, in, in some of the work in the region, in the Asia Pacific region, we have seen the proliferation of the use of alternative credit scoring. Um, are you seeing any developments in this, in the digitization space that's focusing on women SMEs? Yeah, definitely. We see the um, we see for now. For example, all our grant programs are available online. Many women can apply online. Uh, the Fiji Development Bank have got all the applications done digitally. Uh, so we have seen uh, we've seen an increase in uptake of applications that's come through, uh, and even to register your business in Fiji, is, you can do that online as well. So that sort of cuts out a lot of time and effort where. Previously, the uh, any business would go and line up in government offices just to apply for a grant or to register the business. So they can now do the digitally, and that has sort of changed or uh, that has sort of brought uh, to fruition a lot of formalization of a lot of businesses. Yes, there is still a huge chunk that is uh, informal, um, but I think they they are just sort of not ready. They're still very skeptical about formalization and stuff. But that's 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 something we need to change and work on. Uh, but digitalization does play a very critical part, uh, particularly not just for registration and grants, but also even connecting to the market. Uh, for instance, um, just right now we have the market expo going on uh, in Suva. So the uh, artisans have got this, um, this uh, women's expo. That is why my colleague Sarah was not able to make it because she's got the expo going on. So um, just a point in case is one of my staff. We went on to the expo. She just took a photo of the product that was on display and loaded on her Facebook. And instantly she, had two, she got $2,000 transferred into her uh, M uh, wallet, into a mobile wallet on her phone. And her and our diaspora overseas asked if she could just buy those products and send it across to them. So that's the power of digital technology. That is the that's the power of the digital transformation. However, there needs to be a lot more training opportunities available to make our uh, woman led or woman entrepreneurs more aware and more digital literate. I must I must say. So the digital education is that they know how to use it, but they don't really know how to sort of keep them sustainable. It's only when they need money, uh, for example, for a certain need uh if, if the school fees are coming up or if there's a, a function in the village they would make these beautiful mats beautiful uh, artifacts and they would just take a photo of it it's posted on on facebook people order it and they just send it across through the uh, post offices so um but it's not digital marketing per se it's just very ad hoc basis um, but it shows they have that appetite to do so if they really want it uh so uh, yes digitalization in fiji is part of it, and we see this is part of our e-commerce uh, strategy that has been that is currently being developed as well. Amazing! I think that's a really amazing um, use case. I think that um, also points back to what Shiga was sh sharing earlier that many are actually now doing business uh, or participating in e-commerce, and and I guess. Um, you know, um, in this initiatives like that also needs to be scaled. I see that there's a lot of informal trade also happening uh, on Facebook. Um, and um, it's amazing that, you know, technology can help uh, increase velocity of trade, um, especially if there is a, a mobile wallet or a financial account that is um, uh, being used as a tool by these uh, women entrepreneurs. Maybe before I go um, to, to Sarah, one last question, Faisal, is um, from your um, point of view, um, what, are, what do you think are some of the missing policy actions that support women-led um, MSMEs um, and entrepreneurships in, in Fiji? Um, 
any lessons you think uh, that we can pick up from other Pacific countries or from the wider Asia Pacific region? I think um, for us, Fiji, we are more or less we are learning as well. Uh, we have not got at the stats would show you as a, in CG's presentation, it was quite evident there's lack of data. It's only when we have data that we're able to sort of make more correct policy interventions. Uh, but from what we see, what we observe on the ground from our first hand experiences, there is uh, there is a lot of potential because what I'm trying to say is that our graduates that comes out of the universities are more women, are more girls, are more young girls coming from our graduates from our universities. There are more girls graduating Fiji than boys. But but if you're able to sort of replicate it in a business sense, uh, our universities should at least try and teach entrepreneurship. If we're able to, our universities right now, we don't teach entrepreneurship. So we're losing that, uh, we're losing the time and opportunity to help girls or help aspiring entrepreneurs go to the university to sort of uh, learn about entrepreneurship. Uh, in Fiji, what we are taught is accounting, finance, economics, and business management, but there's nothing, it's not really entrepreneurial. There's nothing really entrepreneurial about it. Um, so if there is something that we could learn and adopt uh, for Fiji, we would, I would encourage if entrepreneurship could be part of a curriculum um, because that's the only time or only time a phase in our life where um, girls or even young young entrepreneurs have the opportunity to really focus on the theoretical part of uh, running a business or learning about businesses. Yes, you learn on the job, you learn as you go. Um, but like, if you don't have those fundamental uh, grounding, it's really um, then you will your chances of success is, of success will come much longer. But you at least have the theoretical knowledge, you can apply it as you as you sort of move ahead. And then so, so by the time they sort of graduate and they work and then they have other obligations, they get married, they got children, uh, you know, and then there's the domestic obligations. So it's harder for them to go back to sort of join accelerated programs. It's harder for them to join incubators. It's harder for them to uh, go back and do further studies on entrepreneurship. So if we're able to capture it at that point in time at one person's uh, lifespan, it, I would suggest that if we could sort of, if we could... Um, Harness the universities. So we are trying to talk to some of the universities if they can introduce some entrepreneurial uh, causes uh, uh, in the curriculum, and uh, hopefully that will sort of be like one of the game changers uh, later on. I agree. I agree. I think, and that's um, that's a fair uh, observation. And thank you for raising that. I guess you know, you know, skills development and human capital is very important, especially. Um, you know, with the digital economy, um, and 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 I guess also digitization has a role to play with the lack of data uh, being able to um, digitize uh, much of the manual data um, that's um, usually um, used by MSMEs. Um, so I'd like to turn over to, to Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Um, your CV speaks for itself, I suppose, and, and you've done a huge amount um, on progressing the agenda for gender equality. Um, from your own perspective, um, what do you think are the key constraints on women's business participation in the Pacific? Thanks, uh, Lizette, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, I think the other panellists have potentially already touched on a few of these points, but I'll just to, I like to think of them in sort of three main groups. The first ones are those that relate to gender norms in Fiji. The others are more of the sort of structural institutional barriers, and then the ones that relate to women, the point around skills, skills. So in Fiji, gender norms still mean that women have the majority of responsibility to be caregivers. I think the estimate is they do about three times as much unpaid work as men. So women already have full-time jobs. So I think to take on running a business, which everybody knows is very time consuming, is already a challenge. Um, as already noted, we don't really have a complete set of data on women's entrepreneurship, but what we do know is 90% of the businesses run by women are in the informal economy. And that is in part, I think, as a way in which they manage both the sort of desire to generate income, but also needing to balance family and other responsibilities. 
So the other challenge I think is around the way in which the women run businesses in different ways. And that relates to the point around trying to manage all of the different responsibilities they have. And a lot of organizational policy and practice and even legislation is oriented towards operating business in a more traditional way, which is that is my full-time job. I run the business. I want to generate a profit and I want it to grow. And that's not always the way that women run their business. And I think to touch on the point um, that Faisal's already mentioned, the access to finance is a particular challenge. And the points around land as collateral is continues to be a problem, but there is some very encouraging practice in Fiji that's already been noted. So I guess uh, related to the sort of traditional gender roles, we hear a lot from the research that we do that women don't feel that they necessarily have the knowledge and skills to run a business. And so they can often stop themselves from doing that, even if they have a great business idea. And this is often related to um, less access to information. I think that's already been touched on business networks and those support networks that might encourage them to take on a business. And it would be remiss of me as well, I guess, not to mention the fact that the rates of gender-based violence in the Pacific are double the global average. And so women entrepreneurs can face violence and harassment at home and at work. And so activities to increase women's economic opportunities can heighten the risk of GBV, but it is also worth noting that it is also a means by which women can become financially independent and leave violent relationships. So those are, I guess, quite a few barriers, but there are also there are also some positives as to women's entrepreneurship in Fiji. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, indeed, quite a challenging environment to operate in and lots to balance um, as a woman. Um, from a policy from a policy perspective, what do you think are some of the measures that should be improved or even strengthened to accelerate women's economic empowerment um, that would support their business development as well? So what we do in the Pacific Private Sector Development Initiative is we actually look at the enabling environment for business development. So we're very much focused on what, what sort of policy measures might encourage this. And we've just developed a new framework in the Pacific that's looking at how gender inclusive the private sector enabling environment is. And we look at that in different economic roles. So women's uh, as employees, consumers, business owners, and leaders. And we did a, um, a workshop in Fiji just this month, looking at some of those policy measures. And I have to acknowledge the excellent work of the government in Fiji. They really are doing some really um, leading work in the region on things like gender responsive budgeting and looking at institutional capacity building for different sectors to understand the different roles of women and to provide them with more opportunities. So I guess, Relating to my point about one of the barriers, the first and most important thing is to address the burden of unpaid work. And again, policy responses around looking at the development of affordable quality care services for both children and elderly people. And again, the government has already taken steps towards this. Um, a big one that I like to talk about is gender responsive procurement, because if you're really wanting women to participate more actively, you have to find ways in which they can grow their business, they can get contracts. So gender responsive procurement can be everything from just making sure that women are aware of public tender opportunities, are trained in the ability to engage in them, anything right through to having sort of preferential scoring and incentives for women to women or women-led firms to participate. And I guess a final one is around sectoral and trade policies. So looking at the ways in which you can create incentives within particular sectors, noting areas like tourism are very important in countries like Fiji and looking at ways in which you can understand how women businesses engage already in the sector and looking at incentives that you can create to encourage more women-owned businesses in those sectors. Quite practical and pragmatic um, um, recommendations there. Thank you, Sarah. So just maybe um, one last question before we go to the Q&A um, session. And what business models do you think or innovative solutions would be promising for, for women in the Pacific? 
So I, I think one thing that I always reflect on is that women are sort of not a homogenous group. So the way in which they might run a business varies quite significantly. So, you know, you do get women who want to run a business in a big company and they want to grow it. But then you're also, as I've touched on, have a lot of women in the informal economy um, running smaller, much more on the M, M side of the MSME, I think is where everyone would probably agree is where you do see a lot of women. And so I think it's about reflecting on the way in which women operate businesses. And we do see a lot more of sort of intermittent generation of um, business activities where there might be specific needs that they want to meet. It might be school fees. It might be cultural obligations. And so the challenge is how do you create a business model that gives some protection? Because I think that's the challenge when you operate informally, you have no legal protections, you have limited access to government support, but also not having overly complex systems that maybe don't necessarily work if you're running a small business. So I think sole trader remains the most common um, sort of business model that is used, but that doesn't provide that legal protection or limit liability. So there are some examples that we've been looking at that don't yet exist in the Pacific, but things like limited liability partnerships or limited liability companies where you can come up with a relatively simple um, system of registration and formalization that brings those benefits of formalization. And one of the key reasons we hear from women as to why they want to formalize is access to finance. So you can give them that benefit and some legal protections, but not make overly complex structures that they won't be able to comply with. Um, but I guess a final point on this, I think, is that um, what we found when we've done research exploring alternative business models is really the first step is for governments to be able to communicate really well to women and do quite serious outreach, I guess, to understand what are the benefits of formalization of the existing models, because I think that's probably the first step before we create new ones. But I think then once there's sort of satisfaction that people understand those processes and they're as streamlined as they possibly can be, I think looking at those other structures that also facilitate working in a collective as well is also under those limited liability partnerships. So that would be our suggestions of possible areas that you could explore. Right. I think I think there are many ways to to scan a cat and and these are you know really important formalization definitely is the first phase to really ensuring that um you know we are able to progress um the gender um agenda in entrepreneurship um thank you for that sarah um thank you faisal um we'd like to now go to uh the question and answer session um please do write your questions uh enter your questions in the in the Q and A um, box, um, you know, please feel free to ask a question to Shige on his research, um, to Sarah and to Faisal. Uh, we have um, one question. Thank you so much for asking this question. Um, we have a question from Richard Supangan, um, and he asks, "What are key barriers and challenges to develop women entrepreneurships in Fiji and the Pacific?" And how can the government respond to such barriers and challenges? Would anyone like to take that? Hi, Lisa. So if you don't mind, so uh, I can say some things, but uh, so already so Sarah mentioned. So actually, um, being informal or unregistered is one of the very much so critical impediments for this growth of the women-led businesses. So informal businesses uh, cannot receive government assistance timely and cannot access to formal financial services and cannot materialize innovative business ideas and limit their growth potential. So advisory and training programs for incentivizing registering so informal businesses would be so very much crucial so for women-led MSMEs to grow further. And also promoting so women entrepreneurships, everyone mentioned, is also a critical so for uh, business and economic diversification at the national level. 
So, and also everyone, so touch your phone. So business digitalization or selling so products and services online and also managing the so internal control system digitally. So we maximize uh, women's so business uh, potential and also contribute to creating the base of entrepreneurships in the country. I think so uh, with this perception, government so needs to promote uh, the you know uh, policies and strategies uh, for these uh, women-led MSMEs and entrepreneurships. Um, okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Shige. I think in, in some of our projects, we'll definitely take that into consideration, incentivizing the registration of informal businesses. We have a few more questions. Um, thank you so much, Lester Nerito. Um, his question is, um, in Fiji, what industry um, the, is the government promoting for women entrepreneur taking into account financing among all other things? Can you clarify that a little bit, Lester? What industry? Maybe if you could clarify your question a little bit more, Lester, and then we'll come back to you. Um, let's go to um, Naoyuki Yoshino. Um, first question, credit guarantee by government is one of the ways to smoothen bank lending to women entrepreneurs. Second, is there summary of success stories of women entrepreneurships in Fiji and the Pacific? And third, is there any failed stories of women entrepreneurships? Quite important because we need to learn not just from success, but also from failures. Please um, share with us any lessons that you might know. Um, from Yoshino san former Dean CEO, ADV Institute. Okay. Anyone would like to take that question? I think Faisal, you shared one uh, really interesting um, use case or, or, or success story earlier. Um, any thoughts um, around these questions? Any insights? Sure, I think um, maybe if I could just also try to answer the second and third questions. Um, in terms of the question raised by Lester, uh, what industry the government promote for women entrepreneurs, um, we are happy to promote all sectors, uh, given that we are relatively a developing economy. And as a developing economy, you're trying to also diversify the economy. So we look towards innovation and uh, areas where with the women can take lead. And we've seen that mostly the women participate in the services sector. For example, the hairdressers, the sewing, the tailors. Um, you see the mostly women in those areas. You see in the wholesale and retail uh, sector. Uh, you'll see a lot of women participation in that. You would see a lot of um, participation women in the artist, um, creative arts sector, which is the um, the, the ladies that make uh, mats, the traditional mats, the poetry, the poetry, the uh, uh, artifacts. Uh, so we've seen a lot of um, a huge, uh, huge uh, numbers of uh, women in the in those areas. Um, so those are the traditional areas. They are not so much into say agriculture per se yet. Uh, we have not seen much women in um, in accounting and finance or in legal practices. Uh, women led. That's what I'm talking about. Um, but we've seen them slowly coming in uh, areas of IT, uh, digitization, uh, marketing. Uh, so these are the areas that they are also offering those services. So uh, just on the second question, the credit guarantee offered by government. Um, and what are the success stories? So I guess there's a lot of success stories that we can share. Uh, for instance, there is this. Um, there is uh, there are some success stories available on our web website as well. Um, so w is on www.mctt.gov.fj. Um, our website does contain some success stories. So what happens in terms of uh, we do support a lot of cooperatives. Uh, so our cooperatives, women-led cooperatives, uh, that's around Fiji. Uh, for instance, in the pandemic, we had this woman group that were operating informally. They were running the village shop. And uh, during the pandemic, they, they formalized themselves into a cooperative. And as, as a result, they were able to sort of now diversify into agriculture, meaning that they were able to plant root crops. So in Fiji, we have got two traditional root crops, which is the cassava and the dalo, the taro, and, um, and cassava, they call it. 
or tapioca, tapioca. Uh, I'm not sure what it's called in your regions, but in Fiji, there's the two of the main stay um, root crops. Uh, the, so basically, we saw that from a shop, they now they've started into uh, selling uh, agricultural produce, and now they're also making flowers out of it. Uh, the flower, uh, because of the Russian war and also the high in, the, during the uh, pandemic, there was lack of, lack of imports coming in. So they were they as a substitute for wheat, uh, or flower wheat. They use cassava as 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 the flower as a substitute. So from that flower, they ended up making cakes and pancakes and baking making stuff to sell around the public. So this is how they were able to formalize themselves as a cooperative. And once they were able to formalize, they were able to diversify the opportunities because they were their strength in numbers. So that's just one example I can share. In terms of failures, I suppose. Uh, like any business, it's not just uh, gender specific. Um, you know, you fall down seven, you get up eight times. So I guess uh, even for some women entrepreneurs, they they would um, they would sort of start off. They would sort of be a bit more skeptical. Some of them they've they've tried their hands in areas where they uh, was male dominated. For example, some car washes they tried. Some tried to do into construction, but I guess because like the nature of the sector, they're not able to penetrate uh, properly or still themselves up until they found a foot in other sectors, which we found out that they were more passionate and more skilled around that area. So those that's how they sort of been able to adapt to those failures. Um, but yeah, we normally see those that um, try to penetrate into more male-oriented sectors. That's where. Um, because I guess the lack of organizational support, the lack of network support that's uh, not there yet, um, it's um, that's where they sort of not don't do too, too well. Um, or because sometimes they just lack the business acumen. Uh, even if even if some uh, ladies do want to enter into uh, a canteen store, for example, just down the road, um, because they because they think that the neighbors doing it, they can do it. Uh, so that's just some areas that uh, because there's like the business uh, skills and the business uh, uh, the acumen that's needed. So sometimes that's why they lead to their failures. Thank you for that, Faisal. Just conscious of time. Um, thank you so much for your questions. All very interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time, but uh, Sarah, I know, is going to drop off very soon. So just very quickly, maybe 10, 20 seconds. What key message would you like our audience to take away from this webinar? Sarah, over to you. Any thoughts? I guess, you know, just understanding that women are actually very entrepreneurial in Fiji and across the Pacific. And I think sometimes it's not the lack of necessary good ideas or good business things. It's just recognition of the context in which they're trying to operate and the systems that they're trying to navigate and trying to bring those systems, I guess, to sharing information and making it much more accessible and easy for women to take those great ideas and make, you know, flourishing businesses that are going to contribute to economic development in Fiji and other parts of the Pacific. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Faisal, any last thoughts? I'm going to ask you as well, Shige. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I think i uh, happy to participate in such forums. Um, and if, uh, if this could continue on a regular basis, happy to share and exchange and especially learn from other countries as well. Thank you, Faisal. Shige, any last thoughts that the audience here? Okay, uh, uh, like okay. thank you, Lizette, and so everyone so participating, so staying with us. So lastly, so if I say, so given the limited data availability of MSMEs and foreign businesses in the Pacific, actually the monitoring system of farm level data, so including sex disaggregated data, so should be appropriately established to promote evidence-based policy making for women-led MSMEs and entrepreneurs, so nationally. So this is actually the very, so starting some point, but so we need the so appropriate data to so make so feasible designs of this so policy making so for uh, women-led MSMEs, that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Shige. And with that, we have come to the end of our webinar. We would like to thank everyone for supporting the Asian Impact Webinar Series since 2020. For updates on upcoming webinars, please do check the webpage uh, adb.org, and you can also view the past webinars from ADB's official YouTube channel. 
So please also follow um, ADB's chief economist, Mr. Albert Park on X, formerly Twitter, to gain insights into development challenges facing Asia and the Pacific. And with that, we are all switching off. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to our panelists, Sarah, Faisal, Shige. Thank you so much for your time today and enjoy the rest of your day.